Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash beat and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash B-E-A-T. And I see the robbers. I'm just searching for equality, looking for some reason, no finding no apologies. But I do want opportunity, hard work, hitting you. Hey everybody, it's your girl Rachel Jim, and I'm back for another week of Melanin Boulevard. We have guest Natasha Johnson on the line this week. Uh, she is a multimedia artist and author of the self-publication. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm just here by myself because we can't go anywhere, but... <laughs> But um, so far, so good. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're at least healthy. You know, these days you have to be thankful for the little things. Well, it's not a little thing, but, you know, not being able to go outside the house, we kind of get a little crazy, but it's not, you know, it's not worth risking your health at the same time. Right. I, it's really not. And um, what's crazy is I, I had like a slight cough and I got like really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I was really scared. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, and hopefully you are, too. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I've been in the house. Um, you know, this is the first time that I've been out in the last few days. I think maybe I went to the store f- like four days ago. Um, but I'm in the house, you know, not because I wanted to. I wanted to get outside, but trying to keep up with my kids. Schoolwork is a lot. Cooking, you know, kids got to eat every two hours, it seems like, like newborns. Um, yeah. <laughs> and like Mm-hmm. Now that, <laughs> but now that they're um, out of school, it's like a lot more on. You know, it is a lot more on the parents because you have to you have to like break up your time, and it's a lot of things to do in a day, especially when you're all in the same space. Right. Yeah. It's uh, our days get away from us. We're staying up super late, <laughs> and I'm like, you guys, this isn't summertime. But um, <laughs> it's it's been a little. It's an adjustment for everybody. It's just been a little different. Um, I've been definitely working more on, on things that I, I should have been working on. Uh, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm excited about that. How have you been occupying your time? I I feel so free and I hate that this had to, like, this is going on, mm-hmm. but you're like, when you're working all the time, you, you don't really realize like how much like a long time you are missing out on. Mm-hmm. So I've been able to get some stuff together, like. Uh, I also work on um, an after-school program, so I've been getting, like, documents ready for that stuff. And then I've been able to plan more for the book series and then um, the short documentary series. But most importantly, I've been able to, like, drop some stress off of my, like, life because I'm <laughs> I'm always stressed out. And it's because I never have any me time. So even though it's, like, crazy what's going on right now, we all have to stay safe. Mm-hmm. I do feel better being at home and just meditating, you know, to keep up with who I am and not lose myself in a, a busy work life. Right. You know, I'm not going to lie. I have a, uh, I've been kind of relaxing. <laughs> I know. I'm like, this is a great reset at this time. I'm, I'm like, I'm not, it's terrible because you want to do things only because you can't. Like, I'm like, I really want a Starbucks, but I really don't trust anybody right now. I don't trust anyone's hands. Uh, so I've just been trying to stay out of that. But um, definitely being at home and realizing like, man, I'm, I run around a lot. I run around the city a lot. So it just feels nice not to have to be rushing off someplace. And it feels good. I like it. I <laughs> It really does. It's a. Uh, it's it's sort of. I believe that this is maybe the universe like telling us we all need to kind of reset. Yeah. And just take a break and kind of start over. Right. I'm telling everybody like take advantage of this time right now and figure out a way to reposition yourself. So when it and when everything does get back to moving, we're not even going to say normal because it's not going to go back to what we know as normal. But um, when everything gets back to us being able to be around each other, um, set yourself up to where you, you have something going, um, start a new project, something that you've been wanting to do, do it now. Don't, I don't want to see people. I hate the fact that I have to see people say that they're bored. I'm like, you shouldn't be. Right. You can read a book, Mm -hmm. you can listen to like the audible you can ju- you can do all sorts of things in the house i mean trust me because i i hate going places anyway <laughs> <laughs> so i'll find something to do like 
so it is a good time to uh, really like dive deep into like what you really love and then start creating from from the core. Because if not, then you, yeah, you will let time slip away from you. Yeah, it can. It definitely can. I've caught up on some. I've seen some good documentaries. Like yes, I'm like, where have I been? But um, <laughs> I love it. You know, being able to just really sit down, hang out with my kids. Is, I really appreciate that time because I know it's going. It's going to get back and it's going to be popping because I'm about to make sure it's popping. Um, and when I talk to business owners, I see a lot of business owners re like trying to stay in business and trying to figure out a way where they can stay in business. Um, everything is forever evolving. And if you can't adjust with the times you're going to, you're not going to last. Um, right. so I know before we started the show, you kind of wanted to touch on how this coronavirus is affecting black families and the black community. Well, I feel like, well, and this is just from my like personal perspective, you know, like mm -hmm. what I'm, what I'm thinking and sort of what I'm seeing that's affected everyone overall. But lots of people are being laid off. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing articles about that. Lots of people are struggling because, you know, th they rely on the school system sometimes. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but, you know, their children eat there, you know? Yeah. And what happens is uh, the budget they set aside for their family to survive and for them to live well and to just to be healthy is now altered because this thing, this happened really sudden. It did. Like, I, yeah. You know, I do believe that, like, I got sick in um, December, and I was really, really sick. I don't think that was the flu. I don't know what, you know, I was like, what the heck? But whatever it is that's, like, hitting us and sweeping us, like, right now, it hit people so fast that no one had time to prepare, mm -hmm. you know? And it's unfortunate for um, families and, you know, black families and, and families all over, but I'm speaking from the perspective of the black community um, we haven't necessarily been granted generational wealth. We've helped other people build it, but we haven't been given the opportunity. Well, no, we haven't been given, given the opportunity because there's always these roadblocks in the way that stops us from getting to where we need to be. Like, we do have uh, lots of people uh, financially well off, mm -hmm. I will, but... Uh, the masses, you know, it should be more of our people who who have that wealth because we we um, we did work hard. Our ancestors did work hard to build it. So when stuff like this happens and we have many of our people who are living in poverty, it can cause um, a bit of a, a major shift and not in a good way. Right. Um, and we don't have the the insider, you know, the inside scoop also, because um, a, a lot of these big businesses knew that things were going to get shut down before we knew. And so they were able to make adjustments and prepare for these things to happen, whether that is, you know, sell or buy stock, um, because certain things are have increased in value. Certain things have decreased in value. So they sold before they lost money and bought so that now they're profiting off of certain things um, based on our the, based on the situation of the world um, the fact that we have still CEOs and owners still making a lot of money and la laying their laying their employees off um, our our community the majority of them are, is going to be the working you know the middle class and that's who gets hit the hardest because they don't necessarily get the help from the state they're working, they make too much money, but they're also right. check to check. So when something like this happens, they're like, well, I don't even know how I'm going to pay rent for April, you know? Right. Um, so really puts us in a, in a, in a really bad situation and a really bad position. Um, at the same time, they're offering these stimulus checks, but that is not free money. You're, they're going to get their money back in some way. And so from what I understand, that stimulus check basically is your next year's tax return. Uh, <laughs> no. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always, you know, it's always something. Right. It's always something up their sleeve. Like, it's just, <laughs> your part of me is like, nah, you can keep it. <laughs> no, that and that's exactly how I feel. It's like, instead of doing that, just make it to where, you know, you're just going to have to work it out with your landlord because they're not about to be evicting a bunch of people. Then when everything does get back, it's going to, they're going to be in more of a hurt. Might as well keep the people you have, work with them and, and go like that. Uh, I I don't, I necessarily don't think that it's a great idea, the stimulus and it's not free money and it's not, we're not,
not benefiting the most. It's the big corporations that are benefiting the most. Most um, these mortgage companies, they're going to get bailed out because now they can claim a loss. Right, and then these large corporations are actually the ones who always put people like get us in tough situations. Mm-hmm. They. Like, even if we're talking about, like, the environment, like, climate change, or we're talking about, like, the rights of people, just Mm -hmm. normal, every people who don't, like, they just really always take up more than what they need. And it's just the rest of us out, like, in the cold, we're trying to figure out how to stay warm. And that's, that's a, that's a huge problem, especially that we have here in America. Mm -hmm. It's like, I get that people will have to make a living. I understand. But greed and the idea of capitalism at the expense of other people is really terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. You know, they, I know they're definitely going to benefit from this in the long run, these big corporations, because of the, um, you know, the things that they can claim uh, when it comes to business and how they're covered. Um, and at the same time, when we look at these big companies and, and realize how much money they, they do make, the fact that them being down for a week has them hurt, it, it makes you really think like how stable were they? They weren't that stable. Um, right. And, and so they rely on people. They, yeah. they rely on the backs of people mm-hmm. who have less. Than yes. Yes. Um, the people who make the business go are, are the ones that's that's really hurting. Um, so right now, I um, kind of try to think about what can we do at this time uh, to make things better, try to make it as, as, as good as possible. It's hard when, uh, for a lot of like small businesses that have storefronts um, that aren't considered, you know, a, necessar- a necessary business. Um, a lot of black businesses out here, like the restaurants, they're still working. Um, and it may be slow, uh, because people are scared of getting things from outside sources. But I do know, uh, if I'm going to go out to eat, I'm going to a black restaurant because they need the help. They need the support. And, um, I'd rather give my money to them than a, you know, a chain, a food chain. Right. Uh, it's, 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 uh, most of these food chains are like, they're very commercial mm-hmm. and they they kind of start over time and over the years, they start to lack human compassion. So when you walk into um, a smaller owned restaurant, whether, you know, like especially a black owned, um, you just have a, a sense of self and you can connect and actually understand the uh, embrace, like how they embrace the culture and how they embrace their customers. So it's uh it's important that we do continue to find ways to support during this time mm-hmm. because we support each other then the money will rotate and just like bounce back around inside of the community right so that way situations like this happen again we're not stuck or we're not in any danger at least not on a massive level yeah um I went to uh, this restaurant called Fat Snacks and um, just because of the things that I do in the community, um, I know them. So I made my order and, you know, my order came out to what it was. And so he wouldn't even let me tip him. He gave me an extra piece of food. I was like, you know, you really the fact that they appreciate you coming to do business with them and he wouldn't even accept my tip um, shows like how much he appreciated the fact that because you could have went anywhere, you know. Um, so anytime I go out to eat, I make sure I go to a black owned restaurant and this is the perfect time to reset yourself and recondition your thinking because now we have time to think. We're not on the go. So it's not like, oh, I got to hurry up and grab something in the area. Now you can really make a conscious decision of where you're going to shop and where you're going to get where, you know, where you're going to give your money to. Um, right. So I think right now is a vital time for black businesses it is very vital. And if you have a black business, make sure you're still um, working with those customers that you have because the you know, they're going to remember this time and that's going to sustain your business so how you treat them and you know the fact that you show appreciation that they even came to your your establishment during a time like this um is very important exactly um it's all about the mutual respect and it's it's also about building in an organic 
like fan base. Well, not even fan base. I don't say, I want to say like fans, like, mm-hmm. but like, organic connection with your consumers. Right. Right. Um, um, yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. Um, I do feel that. <clears throat> I do feel like, like, and I agree with you. Like, right now is the the perfect time to start doing a bit of research when we have downtime about black owned businesses. I know some places are um, filled with more black owned businesses than others. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, you can support online. You can yep. you can do all sorts of things that uh, can really help, uh, like push the community forward because. Mm-hmm. We are starting to, and I love that the, the internet can be a blessing and a curse. Yeah, it can. I, yeah, yeah. We, we see, I, you know, I see all kinds of stuff on it. And I'm like, what the? Mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> it's like some crazy stuff out there. But it's it. What's so cool about it is where there's bad, there's good. So it's easy to find black-owned businesses uh, via Instagram, via mm-hmm. Google. You just, just you can just start looking, and nothing. Now nothing with so many popping up everywhere. Nothing can get in your way of supporting. Or just going the extra mile to do that. Mm-hmm. I, I think personally for me, and not even I think, I would rather jo- drive thirty miles to support a black owned business than ten because I want to get that experience. I want to see more people like me working hard and going after what they want in life and chasing their dreams because mm-hmm. I didn't see a lot of that growing up and that can have a huge influence on a child's development and how they see themselves in the world. You're right. They, um, you know, they see the possibilities. If you never see anyone like yourself doing, you know, having their own business, you may think it's impossible. Um, so that's where, um, you know, that's where that self-confidence comes in at. That helps build your confidence as a person, as a black person. That's so important to see people like yourself doing doing things in the community, doing following their dreams, period, whatever that may be. Um, that's really important. Um, so before we get into getting to know you, because you have a lot of great things going on, um, I want to let everybody know um, during this time that I've had downtime, I actually launched another leg of Melanin Boulevard. Um, it's called Melanin Boulevard After Dark. It's going to be a fun show uh, and um, I'll be releasing dates of shows and how to get those shows soon. I'm really excited about that. And um, I'll have also a new radio show that I'll be launching, too. So this time has made me had has forced me to sit down and actually put the pieces together because I've been talking about it for for the last few months. But um. I'm, I'm thankful for this time because I've actually been able to really put it together and figure out how to benefit and monetize off this time. Um, so as we push on, because outside of the coronavirus, I really don't know what else is going on. Right. It seems like everything is at a, it's at a standstill, mm-hmm. but then still kind of slowly moving. I see people having fun on the internet. Yeah. You know, they're, tr- they're trying to make the, the best of their time, which is good, you know, and, um, like as for you know doing research and finding finding out how to better yourself or to grow as a professional in the industry uh, is also a very good thing to do when you have downtime. Mm-hmm. Um, I am actually taking some time to uh, flush out this nonprofit that I'm working on because I'm also an artist, but I'm also an educator. I love helping children because. You know, I didn't have my parents growing up at all. Mm-hmm. My mom was in my life for a little bit. Now, she's a beautiful woman, but, you know, sometimes life gets the best of some of us, you know. Right. So I, I don't hold that against uh, my parents at all, especially during the time that they grew up. Lots of things were being thrown at them. So she wasn't around. But, uh, you know, some of the family members I had and the teachers that I had coming to my life really did help guide me and push me in the right direction because I was so fragile. I probably would have gotten taken advantage of more than I did mm-hmm. because I, you know, but, um, I had the teachers in my life that were really pushing me and motivating me. And I was like, wow, that's cool. If I can change someone's life like that, if I can motivate them and let them know that it would be okay when they're going through stuff, then I know that I'm making a difference. So I'm working on a creative after school program along with four other, uh, not even four, it was four other women, but three at the moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> It will be for when she can get down here because of this virus. But um, it's uh, it's been 
really, really great so far. So I've been taking time to sit down and work on that. And then um, really flushing out my ideas to keep the self-publication going, uh, which is, uh, you know, more geared towards helping the black community uh, because we, we really need to uh, foster and keep that self-love within the community in order to grow. Because not only will we be great when we have generational wealth, we'll also be great if we can just keep that self-love and know that no one else can disrespect your brother or sister in the community. Right. So. I've been taking a little down. I mean, in some some days I've been lazy, but other than <laughs> <laughs> like yesterday, I was just like, ah, I don't want to. <laughs> but mm-hmm. you yeah. and you have the time to do it. This yeah. is the time. The time, and then you you don't have to. If you like working a nine to five, you don't got to worry about being micromanaged and all <laughs> this stuff. Oof. But you know, but uh, it's all it's all good, and it's it's a way to uh just just to really meditate and the time to do what you love. So that's what I've been trying to do to get, uh, get my, my creative juices flowing. Okay. Well, let's first talk about your background and, um, how you got to this point as far as like your education. Okay. Um, well, food, it was a long day, but, um, I originally, you know, like I told you, I didn't, um, I wasn't with my mom and my dad growing up. Mm-hmm. He's actually in Nigeria. He's- uh, cool guy, but he, yeah, he got deported when I was, I can't even remember how he oh. looks, you know. So he's been over there all this time and, mm-hmm. you know, missed my entire life, really. And uh, I did a bit of digging, like, years ago on Facebook, and I found some family members with my Nigerian last name, and that's how I reconnected with him. Oh, wow. But uh, I plan to visit him and just get more information on what happened, you know. Because mm-hmm. a lot of stuff was happening. I don't know what my dad was doing, but Nino Brown level, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he got deported, but mm-hmm. um, I was living with my grandma in West Dallas. Uh, you know, we lived in the projects there. Um, I had older siblings too, but they were like teenagers, and I did have one other sibling, w- which was a year older than me, and she kind of bounced around with me when, every time we moved because mm-hmm. we did shift around to different like households within the family. Okay, so it was it was just kind of hard because you know they were barely trying to you know make a living themselves you know they were really trying to keep up so having extra kids tacked on is like dang you know i gotta take care of them too but yeah. uh, i'm grateful that they were doing that so um honestly i was going to school when i when i did stay with my mom i am not gonna lie we did stay with my mom for a brief time but you know she was struggling mm-hmm. so that out went back to live with my grandma my aunt my sisters just bounced around all over the place throughout the years and um i actually when i was at a stable point like a junior high school i think i went to like two junior high schools moved with my aunt and back with my sister mm-hmm. and i that's when I, uh, one of my older sisters went to uh live at uh, in south dallas in the projects there and i went to a school called pearl c anderson where i met uh, a great art teacher named mrs grisby who uh really helped me get my creative portfolio together uh and advised me to apply to this art school in downtown Dallas mm-hmm. and I got in with her help thank the lord and from there I met more teachers that kind of pushed me and uh, to guide me and stuff like that so I went from Booker T. Washington uh, Performing Arts High School and Visual and Performing Arts High School to Texas Women's University where I met some dope instructors there after I graduated from there I took a, a year off worked in mortgage which I hated <laughs> and then um, I saved up to go to the Rhode Island School of Design and then uh, I just really was like pushing for my passion to help kids you know because every time I had a, a hard time I ran into somebody that lifted me up mm. I met a lot of bad people but I also met a lot of good people too so that kind of kept my spirit going yeah we got to be there for our kids um, and your experience inspired this nonprofit. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. It did. And um, I, I have to shout out from the, the, give a shout out to the kids at Hope High School. They're like, they graduated and they're, they're older now. Mm-hmm. But um, when I finished grad school, I I, don't, I started teaching very young and it probably wasn't a good idea because, you know, they don't really listen. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they were like talking. I'm like, what's wrong And you're young at that not, too. Yeah, like I was like, what is wrong? But they um they did have respect for me because mm-hmm. when you respect kids, when you respect them, they respect you. And mm-hmm. that was a title one school and some of those kids had went through the same things that I went through when I was younger. 
So that mutual respect was there. And um, they that was the last thing that really inspired me to create a nonprofit because the, the spirits there were so good, even though you know, many of them had their their uh, their uh, ups and downs. Mm-hmm. It was that's what really inspired me to work on a nonprofit. And that's called like Smart Project. OK, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a uh, it's beautiful. And I'm building it up because I really just want to make sure that any kid that we work with, that they understand that they matter and that uh, we see value in them and that no matter what, they can reach the stars, you know? Yeah, I think it's more so, of course, having that mutual respect between the teacher and student is very important. But the fact that it that you can relate to them because you have been through some of the same things they've been through is so important. And um, they get to see someone who did follow their passion and, you know, uh, is doing what they want in life. Um, I think that's very important for them to see so that they can see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Exactly. It's all about that uh, representation, Mm -hmm. which is, which is also important. And I'm just going to shift it over. It's also important with the, like the black community. So with the switching over to the self publication and how I got there, I was also influenced in grad school because I was seeing um, all of these bad memes online. And back in 2014, people were going ham on with the colorism online. Mm, Yeah. I was like, you know, I was like, is this normal? Because I, when I went to grad school, I had time to like, meditate be away from home in texas and kind of spend more time online Mm -hmm. i was like this isn't right so when i was there not only was i inspired to create a nonprofit, i was also inspired uh by the people around me to finally do something to combat like the harsh stereotypes the colorism memes all that stuff that people found funny so it was it was great and it the idea didn't come really so it wasn't really solid until like a year after I graduated from um, that school in 2015. Mm-hmm. I finished so about 2016. I felt that uh, I needed to do something, you know, and people on my Facebook page, one of the girls I went to school with was like, you know, you should do something. And uh, I was like, yeah, I want to see a better representation of black women. Mm-hmm. And then that turned from, okay, not only black women with natural hair, but black women in their stories and then black women and men. And that's uh, that's kind of what leads me to where I am now. So with the self-publication, volume one and volume two, can you explain what each of them represent? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love um, volume one because that was that was the hardest one to put together. It really was. It was your first project, too. <laughs> yeah, it was my first project. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of like working out, you know, what I wanted to do with it. Because mm-hmm. at first I was like, I'm just going to photograph women, black women with natural hair because I had did a transition, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I was like, yeah, I don't have perm hair. But after like meeting with the women and you know, photographing them and having conversations with them, I was like, no, nah, I need to um, open this up to be a, a, a bit more than what it is. Like not just images, but words as well. Mm-hmm. Because words have power. Yeah. You know, they really have power. And if people can uh, read these stories and they can relate to them, it can influence them to either change something that's like hurting them inside or to influence the younger generation that they don't have to go through this. You know, they don't have to go through this and we're all love and we're all family. So that was the first one. And the second one I've noticed too, I've some, you know, I've noticed sometimes and I did notice that it was, it's love in the black community. We have black love, but sometimes I see the tension, you know, Mm -hmm. because um, I've kind of, I like to read a lot and I've studied the ways media representation, how, advertisements can influence the way people think yeah. and um i was looking at some stuff uh and i was thinking about why do it's all it's sometimes some of the stuff i see in the media it's always like uh putting the black man and woman against each other or the black women against each other or the black men against each other mm-hmm. and we just needed a safe space to speak and talk so that's what i wanted to do with the second one to open that up for um, for men to come on board as well, and in that publication you have uh, Lenny. He's so he's such a sweet guy. He's a uh, he writes books for children okay. and you know, adults, and he's he's really young and has a really good spirit, a really kind guy. And you have Bernard in there, and you have DB and her husband. Um, it was just really really uh, her, her husband Jonathan. And the words that they use really were great for well, any young man or woman who pick up that book and they, they read those words will, you know, see 
be able to read their spirit and find my love within themselves. So I really thank them for that. I love that. Um, I, you know, society or media is uh, works really hard on keeping us divided and um, trying to portray as if, you know, black men don't love black women or black women don't love black men. And that's, you know, entirely untrue. So I love that you're able to kind of display that and show that. Uh, when I looked at your pictures, for some reason, for me, you can kind of see some emotion behind every single picture. It has like, you can feel some type of emotion behind it. Um, so the fact that you did put words to that in the first one, I think that was very smart because um, looking at the picture, you you know that there's something there. There's a story. And so each mm -hmm. person got to share that. Yeah, they all got to share it. And, you know, and I know it, it might take me some time to get the, you know, the publication done because I like to um, go out and speak to uh, with these people when I'm working with them mm -hmm. in order to feel the vibe and their energy, you know, because I don't want to uh, not I'm not saying anyone like I'm not saying like oh, only pick a few, few, you know, not like that. But uh, it's, it's always good when you can make that connection with people mm -hmm. that have uh, they're like minded in order to move the community forward, you know. Right. So. You know, these people are all great because they just relied on me uh, to help tell their stories and they trusted me. So I didn't want to drop the ball and just like, you know, like, OK, just give me a story. <laughs> right. You really you know, got to know them. It's personal. Yeah. yeah, it's personal. And then the goal is to build, uh, you know, long, long lasting friendships with them. We don't have to talk every day, but just if I see them doing something, I can support it. Right. Or, you know, if one of them are you know they're getting married i'm happy like yeah you got you know it's like like showing the black love in different ways because black love isn't just between a couple it's also black love how we express ourselves in the community and how we support and show love for each other right right how do you find the people that you put into the publication um well it's it's really cool uh sometimes i'll go out and just I remember one time I hit downtown Dallas and they're just randomly like telling people what I did. Like, Hey, you know, this is, I'm trying to do this project. Mm -hmm. I got people that way. Uh, also, you know, word of mouth. Some of my friends are like, I think I know someone. I have a perfect person um, that way. And then I, I'll kind of post sometimes on the internet and um, I, I'll get, I'll be connected. Like my friends will connect me with like minded people or people that they probably don't really know, mm -hmm. but they, Still would be great for the publication. So it's like many different ways. And over the years, I've, I think I've just been meeting people randomly, uh, probably in the store and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's really nice because you, you know, I'm a homebody, so it's, <laughs> it's nice to get out and meet people. Yeah, it is every now and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a lot of the people are there. They live in they live in Dallas, where you live. Mm -hmm. Most of them live in Dallas. Uh, well, a good amount of them, but you know, like Lenny. He's from Delaware. Bernard is from, I think, I believe he's in Ohio. I hope mm -hmm. he's wrong. Um, I've met a few people that, uh, well, like BB and Jonathan, they um, drove up from Houston. Brittany has actually been great. She um, came on board to help me, like, manage the project. Mm -hmm. She's in the volume. And she and her wife have been very supportive. So she's in Houston. And um, she uh, she's, she's great, too, because... <clears throat> She connected me with more people because she uh, she works on a nonprofit and it's just like all black women who run a nonprofit that are uh, working to push the health of women, like the idea of the health of, mm. of women and how to maintain. So it's just some of them are from different parts. Um, I know a few people will fly down, you know, and stuff like that. So they're, they're, I'm trying to branch out a lot more. Okay. I love it. Uh, you have real people. You're dealing with real people. So I, re I really like that. Um, mm -hmm. You are working on the, the volume three version of the self-publication right now? Yeah. And so that one was specifically geared or specifically dedicated to black men, correct? Yeah, all black men, because um, I know this is just a personal thing I, I noticed and I'm just critiquing myself. Mm hmm. I was like, why do I find it hard for me to approach, like, you know, approach men or ask, like, I felt like I was disregarding them in a way mm -hmm. and not on purpose, but I was like, oh, you know, I know women will tell their stories. I was unknowingly just 
putting the ad out for, oh, let's just showcase women. Let me just put women in this book. I'm like, well, no, it'd be nice to have some guys in here, too. Mm -hmm. um, So far, the men that have shared their story, they're very open. Their stories are so beautiful, you know, and these guys are, they come from different walks of, you know, walks of life. They have different professions that they're all engaged in. Uh, most of them have beautiful families. So mm-hmm. it's just nice seeing that and their representation because the society hasn't always showed uh, black men in the best light. And it's, and that's not right. You know, right. You know, I'm, I'm seeing these supportive fathers. I'm seeing these teachers. I'm seeing, I mean, these professors out here, you know, like really doing it and they're writing to be a part of the publication because they know that, they can help inspire someone and then it's a way for them to reflect and, and heal. And uh, it is crazy because we, we as a society and the, you know, just the world can will tell men like not to cry and to be tough. But some of the stories, and many of the stories that I'm getting are uh, speaking on mental health and depression. Yeah. Yep. You know, um, I think the fact that you're offering a space where they can feel comfortable to share their story is is very important. Um, I think specifically our black men need that the most. Everybody needs mental health. But um, I think um, we're starting to see more black men be open to mental health, um, pe- help with their mental health, because they take a lot. Of, they take a lot from the world. Um, yeah. it's always something. And, um, I feel like everybody has it hard, but I feel like black men have it the hardest. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> no, you're, you're right. I mean, from you can, I mean, just by I couldn't watch, I could not watch my I, mentally. I could not watch, uh, when they see us. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't I think that, and I couldn't do it. Yeah, so, I didn't get past um, the scene where they're running through the forest. Like I didn't. I was like, "Yep, I, I already know where this is going. I got. I gotta go. Something's happening with my eyes already. I can't do right. it. Um, it's heartbreaking what what our black men have to go through. And um, as a as a community, we have to do better in how we treat black men. That's everybody. But how black men treat black men. How we treat these little black boys. Um, it, and it starts from them being young. The fact that um, it, ha- it has to be okay that they express themselves. Um, I think that um, if we just start there, that can solve a lot of problems with the mental health, not holding everything in, not feeling like they have to be tough all the time. Um, that's important because now they don't, yeah. they don't have a way to let that out. And that's where we see kind of the behavioral issues and then we don't know how to deal with them, but something happened and they weren't able to express that. So just having the space um, for them to be able to release that um, is the first step in healing for me. That's what I think. Right, exactly. Um, they have to speak, they have to be able to express themselves. They have to be able to cry. Yeah. And because we, you know, you know how you, you can see something, but you can't put your finger on it because mm-hmm. it's not simple. Like the world will make uh, the black men and like black women feel crazy for like pointing out what's going on. It's like, what are you talking about? That's not happening. To, it is happening. Yeah. Like it happening. Right. We know it's common sense. Like we are able to break apart and analyze the methods that have been put in place to shift and break their spirits at a very early age, yeah. right? Because our kids are not seeing many, of, not even many, our black children are not seen as, uh, they're seeing a lot older than what they are uh, at a very un- young age, and which which makes them uh, open to being expo- exposed and tainted at a very young age, you know? Um, stuff like the... Uh, you know, the c- Central Park situation should have never happened. Mm-hmm. And they knew they shouldn't have did those kids. Like, you know, like coercing them to say stuff. Right. You know, just I- I've seen many videos. I've seen enough videos of black children being uh, mistreated in school uh, that is very depressing. And then if they want to go, if people want to go down the road of like, oh, well, we have behavior issues and stuff like that and they, people, what what I notice is people never look at the 
the story on how someone got there. Mm-hmm. Okay? Why why is this child depressed? Is it because their family has been pushed into poverty? You know, like what it's it's underlying issues that no one ever wants to talk about, and it's a historical line that ties back into and ties very far back um, since when the you know the slaves were released. Yep, it's always been these roadblocks or. It's always been um, the com- the community has always been monitored in a way, you know, and pushed this way in that way. It kind of leads us into some of the spaces we're in. Yeah, and uh, so it's, it's it's crazy, really. Yeah, I think um, uh, taking the human part <laughs> into consideration uh is a big is a big deal because for the longest, you know, black people were considered not human. And so obviously humans don't have, you know, horses don't go to counseling. Do horses have emotional issues, you know? So they were looked at as an animal. And um, I think that's where the reconditioning comes in at. We cannot expect these kids that have had traumatic things happen to them. We can't expect them to act normal. Um, And our kids these days are exposed to a lot more than, you know, we were. There's cameras everywhere. Um, So there's there's trauma happening all the time. And we 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 have to know how to address that. And we have to remember that we're addressing a human at the end of the day. I don't know. Sometimes I try to wonder and, you know, my mind can just go into like circles. But I, I, I try to think back really, really far. I'm like why do people feel the need to treat us like, you know, like Mm -hmm. I'm not saying uh, we are, we are a very strong community. That's one thing that I've noticed, no matter where where we are in the world, whether we're in the motherland, whether we're in Australia, whether no matter, even if we were in space, you know, yeah, we are a very strong community and to have survived all the, the things that are being thrown at us or have been thrown at us and still are being thrown at us. Uh, it's a, apparently some magic hidden somewhere. So, <laughs> so I, I feel like maybe uh, you know, with with unity and just like a, some more understanding of each other, we'll be able to kind of build this force around us so we can protect ourselves a little bit more. Definitely, I agree. Um, so, I wanted to talk about your this next thing. Uh, tell us about the Sony Alpha Female Creator. Oh, okay. That was um. That was really cool. It was a, it was actually a residency, and mm. um, what so- what Sony was doing was uh, they were, you know, they they wanted to start supporting more women in photography, in film as well, because it's not a huge representation there. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, it's male dominated, and lots of the guys I've met in the industry they're nice, but you know, once again, it's male dominated. I, I don't know if it's just because of the um, the idea of some women feel like they're not like welcome or they probably haven't been welcomed uh, as much, but they were really pushing to um, it push the women forward. So what they do is like you know they give you tons of gear, you will receive a grant, but you have to you know of course document it, and um, you are able to like really just keep pushing forward and working with mentors and stuff like that. It's really nice because they fly you everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, I like that's that. Really, yeah, no, it was, I was like, oh yeah, London here I come. But it was like really um, nice because right before that happened, I was like, I was feeling so defeated, mm-hmm. you know. I was tired and I was like, man, it doesn't feel like, like what am I doing this for? And I knew I, I loved it, and I had a passion for it, but you know that stuff can be draining, especially when you are on a budget, especially with student loans, Lord. Mm. Oh my god! <laughs> but um, that's a it's a really good program. I know right now everything is in chaos, but they're they're working with a, another group of women. Mm-hmm. But um, their goal is to continue pushing, like helping more women in the industry. And it's just really dope that they're doing that type of stuff. So was it like a contest or was it just like they chose a group of people or did you have to apply? How did you get involved in that? Okay. Well, yeah, they, um, it was, a uh, they released like an announcement on their website and people start sharing it. So what you have to do is, um, pretty much like make a video of, uh, you know, how you know the pro- not how well yes how the program will help you and like what you can get from it. Mm-hmm. Um, I noticed that they picked a lot of the heartfelt um, videos and just people being like really being themselves on screen. 
So you apply with a video. You have to sit, submit a resume, uh, a proposal, which doesn't have to be intent. I think sometimes when we hear that, some people are like, ooh. But it's just it's something simple about what you want to do, mm-hmm. just, you know, paragraphs. And then um, after that, you just you play the waving game. You submit it on their site. It was actually a really easy process. The video is only a minute long. And, you know, the documentation that you need isn't long at all. They just want to – honestly, I think they just want to – reach your words to see what you're passionate about and why you need the help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they got to do something to to, uh, make sure not so hard to make it uh, unattainable, but you got to put in a little effort. They got to see a little bit of effort to know that you're really interested and serious about what you do. Um, Right. So you are a part of the first. So this was the first time that they did this or it says first round. Yeah, I was a I was a part of the first round. I think okay. uh, out of they picked five of us out of six thousand. Wow! And I was like, oh, God. yeah, I was I was like, oh, I was so happy because that's I, amazing. I, got, I I was man, it was I'm really grateful. And um, all of the uh, other women that applied, they are you know beautiful women have beautiful work. So uh, I really liked how they were engaging in the Facebook page. They still kind of opened up uh, many like contests and stuff for the other women because. You know, just because it was only five of us chosen doesn't mean that those other women uh, don't have, they're not up to par. You know, right. I really love that I was still being still able to connect with all of these other strong women, even though they were not a part of the program. Mm-hmm. Th- yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I like that. Um, so currently, um, when we're speaking, you're working on the volume three of the self-publication and you're working on a documentary. Um, are you able to kind of tell us a lot about what that documentary is about? Right. So, uh, yeah, the self-publication volume three is going to be all men, but the documentary uh, is going to be centered around the self-love of the black community and just uh, self-expression on screen. Mm-hmm. So. I, I'm so happy because I actually got my little storyboarding book today. It came in the mail. They didn't want to knock on the door, so they just dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they're doing these days. <laughs> yeah, they like, nah, just get the package. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm planning that out. And my, my goal is to work with five individuals from either the publication and, or either outside. Uh, I know I want to work with Brittany because she's really supportive and she just has a strong presence. She's a, she's a real go-getter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking about u- utilizing Lenny, but uh, I'm also looking for other people that might want to be a part of it uh, to tell their story. Um, now, I don't want it to be just something simple. Like, you know, I really want it to be creative and showing the spirit of these individuals. Mm-hmm. So I have to get a little bit more information from anyone who wants to be a part of it. But it's it's really going to be centered about the love. Uh, inside of the black community and I really want to express the idea of self-love because if you have self-love you have you can have love for other people and then unity forms after that definitely so how can we support you and what you do where can we get the self-publication and when does the volume three drop okay so you can get volume uh one and two on the selfpublication.com um, volume one, you can pre-order that. Those like sold out. <laughs> nice. That's amazing. I know. I was like, yay, you know, but you know, it's, it's taking some time though. Like, it, it like, it, <laughs> they didn't sell out like a month. I wish they did, but you know, over time, like just working on it. Cause as I was creating the stuff, I was also, you know, building up the brand and I'm still mm-hmm. building it up. Right. But, uh, I'm going to order more of those. So you can pre-order, um, the volume two is on there. Um, some, some available. I'm going to order more of those. And I'm also going to do a revised special edition of uh, volume two, which will have a really beautiful piece of artwork on the front of it that includes uh, faces from the participants. But of uh, volume three, um, I plan to have all of the participants like photographed and the stories collected by October. And I'll finish that up and it'll be ready uh, January 1st. So it's a good way to start okay. your new year off. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, it, so we can get out of 2020. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's ugly. <laughs> That'll be a gift to yourself. You I hate to it here. From, man. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great way to start out the new year. We can already plan for 2021. I, I'm so over 2020. We This year was supposed to be everybody's year and it's not. I know. <laughs> I was like, I was looking, I was like, oh my gosh, it's only March. <laughs> right. 
We've been it's beat up. August it wouldn't be so bad, but man, mm. yeah, it's it's still going. I thought it was residual from you know 20, 2019, but no, this all twenty twenty right now. I know terrible. Like people scared and you know we got viruses going around, losing people left and right, and mm. the energy. We just all I want to tell people is this year. It is tough, and I know a lot of weird things are going on, but just try to protect your inner peace and be safe. Be as mm-hmm. safe as possible. Definitely. Um, so just let everyone know where they can follow you. Um, we definitely want to support you in any way that we can. So you just let me know how we can do that. But um, let us know where we can at least follow you, follow you first. Okay. Well, you guys can follow me uh, on Natasha Johnson. Uh, that's my at on social media. Um, so also Instagram. Sorry. Mm-hmm. But my name is so weird. So it's like N-I-T-A-S-H-I-A. So Natasha Johnson all ran together. And then um, if you want to support any of the projects, they are linked in my bio. It's the self-publication is all ran together at the self-publication. And if you want to see the work that uh, I'm doing with the team of girls and the children, that is the smart project. Okay. Program all together. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I follow that one, but I'm de- I'll definitely follow the smart project because I'm interested in seeing <laughs> what you do with that. Um, I definitely want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day. I know you busy out there. Um, at home. <laughs> um, oh, right. Oh. Yeah. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day and, and speaking with me. Um, I think what you do is amazing. Um, and I'm interested in seeing the publications. That's uh, something that I would love to see. That Those are like, uh, what do they call them? Coffee table books? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love those type of books. So um, definitely support. Make sure you guys follow. Make sure you follow uh, Melanin Boulevard after dark if that's your thing. But if not, you know, still follow Melanin Boulevard uh, and make sure you guys tune in every Thursday. Don't forget to tell your friends to tell their friends and maybe we could be friends to tune in every Thursday.